As we know, climate change does not respect borders. So cooperation on climate change adaptation in the marginal sea, like the Baltic Sea, is an imperative. Unilateral adaptation measures may have unintended negative effects on the neighbors. Moreover, transnational cooperation enables the sharing of costs and benefits. It also allows for better management of uncertainties through the exchange of information and knowledge, thereby providing better and more cost-efficient solutions. During its lifetime, Baldadapt has delivered a, delivered a large amount of results and publications, including descriptions of the Baltic Sea region in the future climate, evaluations, impact assessments, vulnerability assessments of climate change, recommendations and guidelines, a dissemination portal even, and, as its main result, a strategy and an action plan for adaptation to climate change in the Baltic Sea region. And the project, I promise you, will also deliver today and tomorrow. But besides delivering all these very important results, the project is also the proof that the roadmap that was laid out by the implementing partners led by the German Ministry for Environment and coordinated by the company Sustainable Project was the right one. In terms of daily project work, the project has gained immensely from synergy effects from its different project partners, including very knowledgeable, knowledgeable scientists working in the field of climate and climate change. These project partners have luckily also had, I think I can say, the ability to present complex scientific results for laymen, stakeholders and policymakers, and also for project for fellow project partners. We have also gained from very devoted professionals that have motivated and facilitated stakeholder involvement in the project and have been able to communicate stakeholder concerns in relation to adaptation to climate change to both scientists and policymakers, and also dedicated academics that understand the complex political decision processes at regional, national, and transnational levels in the Baltic Sea region and in the EU, and who have been able to assist stakeholders and policymakers finding a common understanding of adaptation needs and required actions. I think it's also fair to say that the uh, working experiences we have gained in the project have been very valuable, and the approaches that have been used have proven to be very powerful to reach objective, uh, project objectives. This luckily also leads, uh, leaves the uh, European Commission in a very good position and with a very good example on how to develop transnational climate change adaptation strategies and action plans for other similar regions. So, as said before, adaptation requires an integrated approach reaching out to all sectors and government levels. But now, having a Baltic Sea region climate adaptation strategy and action plan, we also now call and use this opportunity to call for the political levels to take these documents on board to tackle the consequences of climate change in the Baltic Sea. So, with these words, I will welcome you all and wish you all a pleasant stay and a good conference. Thank you. And now the actual conference can start. As a first presenter is invited André Jol, head of group of Adaptation and Vulnerability, European Environmental Agency. Now it's at least recognized 
thank you very much uh, um, for the organizers to invite the EA for this um, conference. I'm very honored to give this presentation showing as an overview of what's happening in uh, Europe. Actually, I gave quite a similar presentation in January this year at the SIC ADAPT final conference in Lille. And there I said I was really, really very impressed with what had been achieved under the SIC ADAPT uh, project. And I said that's probably the most advanced project and um, the example for Europe to look at uh, transnational uh, adaptation uh, actions. However, I have to say, looking at what's been done on the BALT ADAPT project and the resulting adaptation strategy and action plan proposal, I would say probably I was mistaken because I would say probably from my limited knowledge I would have to say that the BALT ADAPT project is the most advanced and I'm really very impressed with all the results you've already produced and I hope your project will lead to further uh, actions and implementation. What I was asked to do was, was actually to give a bit of background of what's happening in Europe. So what I'll do is I'll show something about the EU adaptation strategy because DG Klima, DG Climate Action is not here, so I took the opportunity to say a few words about that. I'll also say something about EEA activities which hopefully are relevant for you. So firstly, just a few words about EEA in case you don't know. We are an EU institute. We are working um, to provide information on the environment for a wide range of stakeholders. That means uh, our member countries, European Commission, European Parliament, but also other stakeholders. We have 33 member countries now, since recently also Croatia um, is a member country, but we also have a number of collaborating countries, particularly in the West Balkans. And of course, climate change is a major part of our work area. So now moving, as I said, to the EU adaptation strategy. As you probably know, it was Commission adoption in April, um, or early of this year, I should say, and there was a stakeholder conference where the strategy was presented by the European Commission, and afterwards it was also endorsed by the Council of Environment Ministers. The strategy actually consists of a communication, which is a short document with the key messages and the key actions. I'll come back to that. There was a very extensive impact assessment document behind, which gives all the um, analysis of what types of options have been on the table and the um, assessment of which options potentially could be the best ones, leading to the actual strategy. Um, there's a green paper on insurance of natural and man-made disasters published at the same time, which also um, addresses climate change and in addition a number of staff working documents are available which I think are really interesting uh, reading and, and relevant documents. I'm not going to go through all of them but you see the list here. Um, particularly I think the one which is quite relevant is the one potentially for, for your work area is the one on developing national adaptation strategies. I'll also come back to that point later. I think you can ask the question, why should there be an EU strategy? I think actually in the BALT ADAPT project you have been asking the same question for the transnational approach for adaptation. And in fact, uh, I feel the answers are more or less similar. There's a cross-border dimension. There's a competence for the EU for common policies. Um, of course, policies like agriculture, which are common, but there are a range of EU policies which are affected by climate change. Economies of scale, quite important with uh, pooling your knowledge, your capacities together, you can achieve more efficient and effective uh, results. But also the issue of um, solidarity, there will be different types of impacts across Europe um, and there will be questions how to deal with the um, impacts currently happening but also in, in the future across the regions and, and how to deal with these different uh, economic damages particularly. And then of course EU funding. Um, there are a wide range of potential uh, instruments available for funding and the strategy highlights that uh, quite in depth. So briefly, um, three priorities mentioned in the strategy. Promoting action by member states, better informed decision making and promoting adaptation in vulnerable sectors. Action by member states, 
Now coming back to the point about strategies, there is the guidance for uh, adaptation strategies in place now. Countries who have not yet a strategy in place could use that, but also countries who have a strategy might be uh, interested to see how they can benefit from these guidelines. The idea from the European Commission is to see how far countries are in their implementation uh, over the coming years. There is the idea to prepare a so-called scoreboard on how countries are prepared by 2014. That's mentioned in the strategy. In addition, countries are needed to report under the so-called monitoring mechanism a regulation, the MMR, by March 2015. So based on these types of activities, the Commission will come with the proposal in 2017 what could be done further. On funding, I mentioned it, um, life is, is one uh, key uh, area I think there will be funding available and these are the priority areas, areas uh, mentioned uh, by the Commission. Um, the third action is on cities. It's increasingly clear that actions will take place very much at the local level, not only, but certainly they will take place there. There have been several activities, projects uh, to highlight this. For example, I'll come back a bit later to the so-called EU Cities Adapt project. And um, the strategy now mentions that there is the plan to include the uh, topic of adaptation in the covenant of mayors. There is already the need for cities who are willing at least to participate in this covenant to, to mitigate, to reduce emissions, but now the idea is to add also the topic of adaptation to the covenant of mayors. Better inform, uh, informed uh, decision making. Um, two key points here, the knowledge strategy, knowledge gap strategy, I should say. A lot of information has already been um, collected, a lot of knowledge has been gained over the last uh, years, uh, not only through EU research projects, the FP7, and precursors of that, but also very much national research. The question now is, what are the gaps? And, and you've really done already, I think, a very good job in identifying major knowledge gaps. Um, they can feed then into the Horizon 2020, the new EU research program. There's also a need for better um, interfaces between science and policy, and DG Klima is having um, proposals for that, uh, is developing proposals for that. Also, EU-wide vulnerability assessments can be improved. Um, one of them is, for example, the PESETA project from the Joint Research Center, looking at the economic damages across many sectors. They are finished the PESETA 2 project now. This is, uh, uh, most, of, uh, most of it is available, as far as I know, and it can be a follow-up project. But that's one. There are also quite a number of other uh, EU-wide vulnerability assessments uh, ongoing and finished. Climate ADAPT is an activity, I'll come back later, where we are involved with the EA. Um, so I'll, I'll say something about it later. Vulnerable sectors, three other actions, um, highlighted some key uh, policies where um, there is a need for further uh, action. It's not only these policies, also other ones, but these are particularly highlighted, agriculture, cohesion and fisheries policies. And um, there is guidance now available on how to integrate climate change there. But then the next steps will also be with the member states and um, with the stakeholders to develop this further. Infrastructure, making infrastructure more resilient. Again, the Commission came with um, guidelines for project developers and guidance for infra. Green infrastructure uh, is currently uh, on the table where ecosystem-based approaches can be integrated. And that's, that's, I think, important to look at um, not only, let's say, so-called gray measures for adaptation, but also ecosystem-based adaptation. Final point that links back to the Green Paper on insurance. Um, there is the uh, expectation that that will lead to further um, potential actions by the insurance industry um, uh, taking climate change into account more. So then I'll move to some activities we are doing in relation to what I've just presented from the Commission. Over the past years, we have been publishing a number of reports um, on natural hazards, on um, adaptation in cities, water scarcity and drought topics, impacts of climate change, adaptation actions on climate change, and 
we're also involved in climate adapt. I'm going to go through some of the key messages out of these uh, reports. But before doing so, I have to say uh, one other thing. Uh, I forgot we are working on networking activities quite a lot as well. The number of workshops and meetings we've been involved over the last year. Um, just a few examples. An expert meeting on adaptation and transport was held at the EA. We're regularly um, working with countries. The so-called EIA Net workshop is happening annually with the member countries, usually environment agencies. Um, we organized an expert meeting looking at national adaptation platforms because we feel um, there is a growing interest for those who manage those platforms to learn from each other. And there will be a follow-up of that meeting um, in uh, Vienna, 7 and 8 November, jointly organized by the Circle 2 network. I mentioned briefly this EU Cities Adapt project that was launched and the results were presented at the meeting in Bonn on 3 June. Uh, that was done um, very much in collaboration with ECLE. ECLE is the European Network on Cities and they are very active in this area and we as EA supported this conference. So here you see actually I think all the 21 city representatives on the picture who were participating in this project. So there were peer cities and there were other cities who were then collaborating with each other to learn from each other. And that idea, I think, will, will grow. And that is also linked to this other point I mentioned before of the covenant of mayors where um, adaptation could be in included. The last point here, we are also working with the West Balkan countries to um, enhance the um, capacity and the um, potential um, adaptation actions in West Balkan countries. Moving to some of the reports then. The report which was published end of last year was on impacts of climate change. We have been showing this, um, the impacts uh, across Europe, uh, about 40 indicators. Many of them have actually already been mentioned very briefly by the previous speaker, so I, I don't need to go through, through all of them. But um, a few other points to make is we are working a lot with so-called so European topic centers. We also have um, collaboration with WHO and ECDC and JRC. Most of these data come from research projects funded by the EU and international databases. The final point to make here that we are not um, an IPCC. We, we, we cannot, uh, uh, from our perspective, do the same in-depth analysis as the IPCC is doing. They will come out with their fifth assessment, um, the first report end of uh, this month in Stockholm. And we will, of course, include whatever comes out of that assessment. If there are changes needed in our indicators, we will include them. So that's on the science of um, climate change, the impacts of climate change. That report from IPCC will be published, published in um, March uh, next year. So I don't expect you to really read all of this, but this is the very aggregated information in a way all of these show an indicator and it shows what types of impacts are happening in the different biogeographical regions in, in Europe, uh, including Northern Europe. But again, that was already mentioned before. One of the messages here is, of course, that you have to go into more uh, regional and even local um, assessments to really come to conclusions which can be uh, used directly to feed into action. So this gives more a broad picture of what is happening in Europe. But the types of indicators can be similar as the ones used at regional or even local level. So one example on natural hazards. There has been, uh, this information comes from uh, Munich Re, from the insurance industry. There has been an increase, um, although slight, I should say, in the um, damage costs of uh, extreme events over the past uh, 30 years. Um, this is not primarily due to climate change. I think that's important to recognize. It's due because we have increases in population, in wealth, in activities in risk-prone uh, areas. We also have better reporting with information, but there is some um, influence of climate change happening. However, uh, with the models projecting further uh, increases in intensity and frequency of uh, events, there is the expectation that there will be further damages if action is not taking place. So I think that's the key message from this, from this graph. 
This type of message also is very much coming from the IPCC report on extreme weather events and uh, from 2012, and that will also be further uh, highlighted again in the next IPCC report. So some of the key messages coming from the report. Um, climate change is occurring. There are wide ranges of impacts on environmental systems and society. It can change um, the socioeconomic imbalances. Again, that's a point I made before. If the damages are higher in a certain area, which is potentially already having uh, a low capacity to adapt, that, that's a problem. Um, then I, I mentioned before that um, due to increases in extreme events, uh, there is a projection um, uh, of uh, the damage cost uh, uh, possible. Uh, it's also important to highlight that there are, of course, different types of hazards across Europe which are leading to uh, the, um, the impacts so of floods and, and droughts are, in, of course, in different areas, different regions of, of Europe. And the main message, in, in fact, at the end is we can reduce these projected damage costs, costs a lot if we take action. Um, then the report we published uh, also last year on, on um, adaptation in cities, which was uh, in a way seen as a precursor of the project uh, now uh, very much done by the Commission. We focused on heat waves, flooding, and uh, what's caused in drought in cities. Uh, how to plan urban adaptation and uh, what does it mean in terms of governance levels, European but particularly national and um, sub-national uh, and of course local level. Um, and we are now including, we are now looking at the results of the EU Cities Adapt uh, project and we, we are considering how to include that into the Climate Adapt platform to which I come later. So just a few key messages. Um, Again, the climate change here is, um, is exacerbating existing socioeconomic pressures. So we shouldn't only look at climate change, of course. We have to look at what's already happening, urbanization, competing demands for water, and those types of pressures. Climate change is additional. For cities, there are specific challenges, which are really uh, quite uh, important to look at. Urban heat island effect, but also soil sealing, which can lead to increased risk of floods. If the idea is that if there is um, already um, uh, discussion about changes of urban infrastructure, that could be the right moment to think about adaptation. So not adaptation as a separate activity, but when there is a need for changes in the sewage system in a city, that could be the right moment to think about uh, adaptation. Point about green infrastructure made out before. Um, so we feel it's important to look at um, a combination of green infrastructure uh, and grey infrastructure as well, and also soft measures. And that linked then also very much to spatial planning. Then something about water scarcity and droughts. Again here the main threats are already occurring, even without climate change, land use changes over abstraction of water, but climate change is an additional pressure here. And it's important to then see the water use in, in a coherent uh, way, um, looking at all the uses of water. So there is an increase in demand from agriculture, households, industry, but we also then need to recognize there is a need for the ecosystems for water. And there are ideas now emerging to uh, have allocation plans of water um, taking into account the needs of all sectors. The last report to mention is on adaptation in Europe, which we published at the same time as the stakeholder conference was organized by the Commission. This report tries to give a first uh, overview of what's happening in Europe on adaptation actions in different countries. It's aimed at policymakers who want to uh, develop uh, adaptation strategies or implement adaptation actions. And it's also meant to support the implementation of the strategy. So here again, some of the key messages. We have um, 16 of the 33 member countries who have a strategy, and some of them have action plans. I should here say that these strategies are quite different in scope, in structure, in types of uh, measures, etc. And there is no, currently no ideal model. There is the guideline from the Commission, but um, 
it's important to recognize they are quite different. But there, there are many reasons for why they are different, of course. Transnational regions have started, I mentioned that, of course, before with the um, Northwest Europe activities, but also other uh, actions are taking place. The Danube has adopted a strategy. Uh, in the Alps, there is um, consideration to think about an alpine region adaptation strategy, and in the Pyrenees, also something similar is happening. Um, the point about um, the, uh, the gray and the green and the soft meshes already made uh, before. And in, in a way, there are a lot of challenges in front of us because <clears throat> when we talk about mainstreaming, it's, it's always kind of easy to say we have to mainstream in all areas, in all sectors. But how do we do that really in a coherent way? How, do, how are we making sure that we're not having contradictory mainstreaming activities in the different sectors? Um, that leads also to the point for the need to be flexible and the need to be um, able to change your strategy if there are new situations arising. And the last point is important also about participatory approaches. Uh, it's, it's really needed to involve all the stakeholders um, who are needed to be involved at the right level. So the report also gives some kind of overview of what's currently happening on mainstreaming in the different uh, EU uh, policies. Um, that was already before the strategy is, is actually now in place. This slide shows how many projects there are actually on transnational level. There are more than 30. Um, so it shows there is really an increase in, in activities at transnational level. And there are opportunities to learn from each other. When we tried to compare countries, we did the first analysis. It's, it's uh, quite, uh, I should say, uh, rough, not so in-depth at the moment. Um, we, we look at what type, are, uh, what type of priority sectors have been selected by the countries, uh, what impact assessments they've been doing, uh, research programs, either climate services, and is monitoring already happening. It's quite clear there are a range of uh, knowledge gaps. And that's also highlighted, I think, in your documents. Uh, and here are some of the key examples. Cost and benefits. Um, there are projects available for uh, where there are costs uh, analyzed, like, for example, the climate cost project uh, at the EU level. Um, but in many cases, we, we don't know if sufficiently the cost um, of the, 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 the more local actions, I would say. And also then the benefits, which don't have to be expressed in economic terms, but it's important to have some measure of what are the benefits. How many people are, let's say, not exposed to flood risk, for example, through measure, or uh, how many ecosystems, or what type of ecosystems can we protect by taking the measure? Uh, there is also not a complete overview really available yet of what's happening at the uh, subnational level, regional level, city level. Uh, there's also very little information, I think, on what businesses are doing, the private sector, um, in terms of ad adapting themselves, but also helping others to adapt, for example, in engineering companies. It's not a, there's a scattered type of information on that. And monitoring evaluation hasn't really started very much. So some countries have started doing that, the UK, for example, Germany. But um, the reason for that is, I think, is that many of these actions have not been yet um, taken, or if they have been taken, not through a long period yet. So, so this monitoring evaluation, evaluation will happen more over the future. But adaptation is certainly already happening, so the report also gives a number of examples. In different countries, different types of um, adaptation actions, these are just a few of them. I'm not going to go through them, but refer to the report. What I'd like to do is just briefly mention a few uh, types of um, actions and why they have been taken. And the reason is that I partly know them better than the other ones, I have to say, living myself in Copenhagen, for example. So in 2011, there was a big rainfall, extreme rainfall event, as you probably are aware of, um, in, in July, and uh, that led to a huge uh, problem with the sewage system, uh, basements of uh, uh, Private properties were flooded, uh, motorways were flooded, huge economic damage. Interestingly, at that time, there was already a Copenhagen adaptation plan in place, but certainly this event triggered much more the need for action. So 
there was quite some pressure, I think, actually, on the city of Copenhagen to come up with, uh, with, with this plan, which they published end of 2012, um, the cloudburst plan to, to address this type of events in future, where they look at high uh, areas with high risk, also trying to look at synergies with um, types of actions already taking place on road infrastructure and also linking it, for example, with the Water Framework Directive activities. And one of the key points also they make, I think, is that they're going for a green and a blue city. So they don't see adaptation as such as a means in, it, in itself, sorry, as, 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 the, as the end product, but they see it as a way to get to what people want, and that's a green and a blue city. In parallel, then, the country also has now, uh, based on these, I think, um, uh, situations and these actions by Copenhagen, uh, developed a cloudburst plan for Denmark um, and also what's happening now is that every commune now in Denmark needs to have its own adaptation plan very soon and there is a whole support system in place to make sure that countries, uh, cities uh, are um, uh, having the right information and can learn from each other in developing these, these plans. One other example is uh, then on coastal issues and sea level rise. You may have seen this before, and I think there's somebody from the Environment Agency of the UK as well on here, so we could add to this later. Um, the Thames barrier has been uh, analyzed uh, quite extensively by the Environment Agency in England to see what is needed if sea level will rise certain um, uh, levels in the future, with of course having quite some uncertainty in it. So the idea is that continuously sea level can be measured and based on what's currently measured uh, and what are the projections, the types of measures can, can change. So the blue line shows some pathway for the future which can be chosen and at the same time there is a need to continue monitoring and then potentially that pathway can change based on what is happening on sea level, but also what's happening in other um, maybe socio-economic uh, developments. And my understanding is that up to one meter there is no need to have a major change in the Thames barrier, but after it rises above one meter the, the need uh, will increase. And then one other example is on the Netherlands, since I'm Dutch, I know there's a bit. Uh, this Room for the River program was established actually before there was talk about the National Adaptation Plan for the Netherlands, but climate change uh, has, uh, I think, um, the awareness of climate change has enhanced the awareness of integrating that into this, this program, Room for the, for the River. And this is one example of the city of um, Nijmegen. Here the plan is to have um, uh, a relocation of, of a levee to have a new flood channel, to have build new bridges and also to build a new island. And the idea there is to do that um, also with the aim to achieve not only sec uh, better security for citizens but also have uh, an improved ecosystem and so have, uh, let's say, also the um, uh, increased biodiversity aspect taken into account. Um, what I understand is this uh, has now started, it took a lot of planning to come to this point, a lot of discussion with the stakeholders, uh, it was not an easy task to get to that point, but now they're in the phase of starting to actually implement and this will take, uh, I understand, up to 2017. So this is the current situation and the future situation would be looking like this. Uh, last point to make is about the new report we're working on now, and that's on comparing more in-depth adaptation actions in countries. As I mentioned before, the report we did so far was not doing that very in-depth. We now want to do that much more going into specifics and details. We sent a questionnaire, a survey, I would say, to um, all the member countries, asking themselves to give their view on how far they think the sectors are adapted. We ask a number of questions. Of course, when the answer will be that they believe the sector is very much adapted, we still would like to see the evidence for that. So we, it's not that we uh, take only the information from the countries, we also want to look at the evidence for this.
it's for such statements. The idea is then we have a comparable information base for all the 33 countries, and then we have a better way of um, uh, giving information on the state of play. Then the idea is that this will link to the scorecards of what the Commission is doing. The Commission will come up with this proposal for this score board, sorry, I should say, by end of this year. And our report comes out next year, and we hope that, and we, we know that the Commission is also going to use the uh, results of, of this uh, activity we're doing into the development of the scoreboard. Climate Adapt, I have a chance to say more tomorrow. It's a platform we are maintaining for the uh, Commission, together with the Commission DG Climate Action. Uh, um, but again, more about that tomorrow. So, finally, some, some brief conclusions. The strategy is, I think, an important milestone. It's expected to enhance adaptation actions, promotion of action from, by member states, better informed decision making, and promoting adaptation in key vulnerable sectors. And at the same time, mainstreaming of climate change is already taking place in EU policies. There is information available on impacts of uh, climate change and vulnerabilities. However, there is still a need should not forget is for further monitoring. The uh, so-called Copernicus uh, EU climate service, I didn't mention that very much before, but that's one of the major activities from the Commission over the future years in terms of uh, monitoring and service of climate change is really important. But also national climate services are emerging and we feel they, they will be important. Still there will be knowledge gaps. They have been identified by your project, others will also identify them, and they have to be addressed further by national and EU research, particularly Horizon 2020. In terms of actions and strategies, many countries have them in place. Um, that's good to see, but there are differences in scope and implementation progress. Many actions are also taken at regional level, at cities and transnational level. And finally, it's important, we feel, to have better sharing and learning of what's happening at different governance levels. We hope the climate adaptation platform can be useful for that, but we feel it's not the only one, and it will never be the only one which is relevant. There is always a need, we feel, for transnational, national and city level networks and also platforms. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We would like to express gratitude to our keynote speaker. Uh, we will have some time for questions and discussions to both keynote speakers. And now we'll continue Eric, Eric Kjellström, Swedish Hydrology and Meteorology Institute, with a report, What We Can Learn from Climate Models About Future Conditions in the Baltic Sea Region. Please. Okay, thank you for inviting me to give this presentation at, at this conference. Uh, I think it's very important to say a few words about climate models and uh, as the information that we get out from the climate models is really the basis for impact studies and for further adaptation measures. So it's good to know a little bit about what these models really are and also to say something about what are the possibilities and limitations with these models. So this is what I'm going to do and I'm also going to, of course, present some results from the models in terms of how the future climate may change in, in the Baltic Sea region. So this is just to give you a very short flavor of uh, what kind of climate change scenarios are around. And this is from the uh, recent large 
international uh, collaboration between all the global model modeling centers in the world. We have regularly, more or less regularly, large intermodel inter comparison projects, and this was the fifth one. It has been completed uh, more or less a few years ago, and, and much of these results are now out in the scientific literature, and they are also being assessed, and uh, we already heard about the next IPCC assessment report that will be presented in a few weeks, and, and uh, at that time we will see a lot of material from these uh, climate model in the comparison project as such. Uh, the figure up here shows changes in the climate globally, as you can see the regional patterns, and to the left you can see changes in temperature, and uh, those maps are mostly red. This is at the end of the century uh, under a relatively high-end scenario, so the changes are quite large. But these red colors indicate an warming. And if you look at the details, you can see that in our region of the world, up here in the north, in the, uh, in the nor northern European regions, the uh, uh, changes in, in wintertime, which is the upper panel, are quite strong in this area, uh, very strong in the, in the Arctic area as well. Uh, so these, uh, pattern, these maps really show that there are regional details to the clo global climate change signal that we often hear about. So it's important to have a regional aspect to, to this as well. Uh, to the right you can see corresponding changes in precipitation instead. And the blue colors means increasing precipitation, while the brownish colors indicate decreases in precipitation. And these patterns to the right are very similar actually to uh, what we know from today's climate, where we have wet areas, precipitation is uh, likely to increase according to the scenarios, and where we have dry areas, precipitation may uh, decrease. And there is also other information in these figures. Uh, this is now based on a large ensemble of many different global climate models, so it's some 20, 25 models or even more. Uh, and these are ensemble averages, so these are average uh, changes, but then there are also a lot of dots on the maps, and they indicate where the models agree or where, where they not agree. And if you look at the leftmost panels again, you can see that for temperature, the signals are very robust, and all of the models indicate that there is an increase in uh, all over the world, basically. Uh, to the right, if you look at precipitation, this is also the case in some areas, but not everywhere. And you can see that the large-scale patterns, if you look at the details here, uh, increasing precipitation, models are quite uh, much agreeing upon that, and also decreases, models are agreeing. But the borderline between these areas where uh, precipitation is increasing or decreasing there, uh, we don't always see that's the same kind of agreement. And this is, for instance, true then for... Uh, see if, I can. Um, if you look at the European area up here, I will show more details later in the regional maps, you will see it more clearly. The models are not agreeing all the time, especially, and it's, this is important for a small region like the Baltic Sea region. I will get back to more details so you can see more clearly in, in larger pictures in a little while. So the talk today will be a lot about uh, the, uh, how these climate scenarios are being produced, and there is a really large chain of different models and, and that we are using. First of all, you need to have some kind of idea about what the missions and what kind of forcing, what is really driving the change of the climate. And then you put this, these forcings into global climate models. And if you then need more detailed information on a regional scale, you may do some, some kind of downscaling regional climate models. And then finally, if you're interested in the impacts, you run model results through impact models. And th these results can then, of course, be used for the uh, adaptation measures and, and, and for, the, for interested stakeholders. Uh, I will mainly keep to this part today then, and, and mainly on the, on the climate modeling part, but I, I will also say a few words about the emission scenarios and the, and the future changes. So I will start actually going back a little bit here, saying something about the climate models. How are these models constructed? So this will be quite basic, and uh, I will even show a couple of equations. Uh, so the first thing you need to do to have when you're want to set up a climate model is you know, need to know what is it that you want to simulate and what kind of processes uh, are important. And for the climate, of course, it's uh, some fundamental things are, of course, things related to the atmosphere and the ocean. But we also need to have information about the land surface and we need to have information about lakes 
and on land we also need to have information about vegetation. And there are a lot of processes and these different parts of the climate system, they are interacting all the time. So we need also to look at exchanges of fluxes between the atmosphere and the ocean and between the atmosphere and the land surfaces. So all of these processes are somehow needed. We need to describe them in the models. And this can be the pure physical coupling between the different parts of the climate system, but it, it can also be related to biogeochemical cycles, for instance. One important thing is, is the carbon cycle of the, of the climate system. If we change the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the uh, uh, fluxes and, and sinks, uh, sinks and sources uh, at the land surface and in the oceans may change over time as well. And this can have strong feedback mechanisms and impacts on, on the climate system. So we need to include all of the relevant processes in some way. Uh, secondly, we need to formulate all of these processes in a computationally efficient way. These are now some fundamental equations describing uh, how the air is moving in, in, uh, in, in the atmosphere and also show, saying something about temperature changes and, and all of these things. I will not go in through the details here, of course, but one thing I will say is that in all of these equations we have time tendencies. These are the ones that I have marked up here. They say something about what is the tendency. So if we have a lot of processes acting on, the, on this room, for instance, we have the sun shining in, we know that there is a warming tendency in here. So we can say that in half an hour it will be a little bit warmer in here. And this can, of course, be form formulated and we can calculate these tendencies. And uh, uh, the clever thing here is that these, many of these tendencies, they, they can be calculated just knowing the state of the system. If we know how, it, how the state is right now, if we know that the air is much colder outside of the room and it's warm in here, we open the door, we know that there will be a flux of cold air in here, temperature will decrease. That can be formulated as well. And we, know, and these, we have these relations up here relating, for instance, wind field and temperature fields in the atmosphere. So we know that advection movement of cold air will lead to a, a decrease in temperature. Tendencies for this can be calculated and then we can add those tendencies to the system and say something about a future state. So this is how we really do this in practice. We set up some kind of model grid structure where we have a lot of small volumes. This is illustrated here to the right with a vertical column up in the air, small grid boxes. They can be a couple of hundred kilometers maybe uh, wide and a kilometer or a few hundred meters uh, deep. And for each of these volumes, we perform these calculations. So we calculate a time tendency for this individual grid box and how it talks to the neighboring grid boxes. We need to know if it's warmer or colder on each of the different sites and, and how the wind is and all of the other processes. So the thing here is to define this kind of model grid. We need to have some kind of in knowledge about the initial conditions, where to start from. And then by knowing this and knowing what processes are acting on the system, we can calculate time tendencies. And then we can add those to the previous state. And then we can have a new state and we can again calculate, calculate new tendencies and we can go back again and iterate here. So this is a repetition of these time steps here. And that can be done for hundreds of years if you like if you know what processes, processes are acting. So in that way we can perform long climate uh, integrations. So this sounds quite simple, and it is simple in principle, but of course this is quite complicated and these models are really very com complex models and they contain hundreds of thousands of lines of coding, computer co coding, so they are quite, quite complex. I will show some kind of problems that we see with these models. Uh, one thing is something we call parameterization. I mentioned that we have some kind of grid boxes, volume, where we perform our calculations. And these grid boxes may be 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers on the side. And in these grid boxes, we only have one number for temperature and one number for humidity, for instance, and wind, wind components. Uh, but then we need to describe things like clouds, for instance, as you have up here. These are now two types of situations on the, that you can see on the sky. Two types of clouds. You can have, uh, to the left, you have two more convective clouds, these cumuliform clouds on top of each other. And to the right, you have one of these, and then you have a layer of clouds. So to the right, the cloud fraction is 
it's completely overcast. This is what a black bar indicates there. It's gray sky if you look up from the ground. To the left, you can see the sun for some parts, and it's only partly uh, covered by, um, by cloud. But then we need to know and to say to the model somehow which kind of representation do we have here. Here, since it's really fundamentally different in terms of, for instance, how much of the sunlight that can penetrate down to the earth and heat, heat the heat system. So these are things that we need to describe. In a, we have very little information in the model, but we need to describe these complex things like clouds, for instance. Another such problem is then, if we look at the left situation here again with these two different types of clouds, how should we distribute them in a the volume? This is another thing we need to think about. Now you can see on the bottom here, typical model clouds. They are not looking as nice as the real clouds on top. They are more like rectangular boxes or something like that. And then you can have a lot of different layers in the vertical and then you need to give the model information about how these clouds are staggered on top of each other. So maybe they have a maximum overlap like to the left or a minimum one to the, to the right. And then you can see that the cloud fraction is completely different as well. So these are formulations we need to somehow uh, put into the model. And, and it's quite sensitive to how, how we do this. The results are quite sensitive. Uh, this sounds like a lot of problems, and there are problems with these models. But we also know that these models are evolving over time, and we learn a lot about how the climate system is working. And uh, we have now better understanding compared to a few years ago. And, and uh, this graph here shows uh, errors or, or biases in climate models and how they are decreasing over time. The smaller the bars are, the better the models are. So there are three generations of global climate models. From the late 90s in, on top, from the mid, uh, mid middle of this decade, or the, or the first decade in, in the 21st century in the middle, uh, those ones were the ones underlaying the, the uh, previous IPCC assessment report that came out in 2007. And on the, the bottom ones are the more the newer, the most the most recent global climate models. And you can see how gradually the errors decrease somehow and the and the and the, and the, the yeah the models the quality of them actually improves. And this is because we have better knowledge, we have better formulation of the models, we have better larger computers nowadays so we can have higher resolutions in the models. Um, but we also include more processes. We go from something called GCMs or general circulation models, global climate models, more into something we nowadays call earth system models, where we try to include other processes like these biogeochemical cycles, for instance, that, that I mentioned before. So given the fact that we include more processes, the models get more complex. There are more possibilities for the model to uh, produce errors and, and problems. So given that, I think the um, evolution here is re really good. So we are clearly improving over time. So now I'll focus a little bit on the Baltic Sea region and say something about how these models perform in this region. So this is now two view graphs from the models underlying the, form, the last IPCC report. And they show to the left biases, problems with uh, errors in temperature averaged over northern Sweden. There is a zero line appear in the, gra in the graph, so a perfect model would lie on that, but they are not, as you can see, and the errors are quite large, so uh, there are errors the order of five degrees or even more for certain months of the year. This is not a seasonal cycle of these biases. In 20 or so different global climate models, these are all the individual lines out there. And to the right, you can see instead precipitation. Now, this is not errors, but this is the monthly mean precipitation, and the uh, heavy... The, heavy black line and the dashed black lines are observations. So you can see that most of the models they produce a seasonal cycle which is quite reasonable with the maximum precipitation somewhere in the summer. Uh, but there are also for precipitation quite large errors in the models. And these errors and problems, they are really problems if you now want to run and use an impact model like a hydrological model. If you have errors in the precipitation with 50% for instance, that's a really large problem for a hydrological model where you want to calculate the flow in one single river. So one thing that we can do a little bit is to try to increase 
the resolution and to better describe the processes uh, on, the, on the local and regional scale. Uh, so this is what you can see illustrated here by the two grid meshes to the left up here. Typical global climate model with a few hundred kilometers resolution. You can hardly uh, recognize the Baltic Sea area in that map. But if you go to a 50 kilometer grid uh, to the right, the map starts to emerge and you really re recognize a lot of the, of the land contours, etc. So it means that we get a better hold of land-sea contrasts also, the altitude of the mountains is much better in that higher resolution, which is very important for precipitation, for instance. But another thing we also gain by increasing resolution is that we can really say something. The, the model is better, has a better capability of uh, simulating processes that are important. And uh, in this case, especially like the, the mid-latitude cyclones, you can see a typical cyclone up here. Uh, over the North, North Atlantic. And this is, these are features that get better uh, represented in, in models with high resolution. It is, of course, computationally demanding to run these models at very high resolution. Every doubling of the horizontal resolution leads to an eightfold increase in computing power, since you also need to increase the time step by a factor of two. So it really quickly grows very, very quickly. So, one idea that we are using here in the climate modeling community is to set up regional climate models that only operate on a small region somewhere, like Europe or some, some other region. And uh, those regional climate models are then fed with information from the global model on the lateral boundaries. We take information from the large scales from the global climate model. And then we make the calculations on a more detailed scale in the interior of this model domain to get uh, a higher resolution and more realistic processes. Uh, we do still have a problem even with these regional models since they, are, they need information from the global models. These are now three examples of land-sea masks from three different global climate models. The one to the left is what we can term a high-resolution global climate model. The other two are not. They are really coarse-resolution models. And uh, in those models, in one of them, there is a Baltic Sea, but there is no Denmark and no southern Sweden. It's, that's ocean in that model. And in the other model, there is no Baltic Sea whatsoever. If you now want to run a regional climate model, taking the information from these models, uh, you can think about what happens when we want to say something about sea surface temperature, if that is not calculated in the regional model. You have to take that from the global climate model. And of course, we can realize that quite quickly that it's probably not very realistic. So. We have a problem even if we try to make these downscaling experiments that we need, still need some information from the global models. So, how good is then a regional climate model, RCM, in the Baltic Sea region? This is just one example showing um, uh, the uh, large scale pre pressure pattern and temperature in winter time over Europe. To the left is observations. And to the right are biases, errors in one such regional climate model. I don't have a color bar, I realize that now to the right picture, but uh, I can assure you that the white colors here indicate that th the differences are small. They are uh, less than one degree in all of the white areas. In the blue and red areas, biases are of the order of one or two, or in the really dark red areas, up to three to four degrees. So by and large, if we have such a regional climate model, and if we force that model, now this is important, I didn't say that, but in this case, the regional climate model takes observations on its lateral, lateral boundaries. So the winds coming in from the Atlantic or from the southern, southern Europe, they are, uh, or from outside of the model domain, are really governed by observations in this case. Such a model can then produce a relatively realistic uh, climate, but still with some errors, as you can see. And uh, most often these models have a very good agreement for the large-scale circulation statistics, that is the pressure patterns, the, how the low pressure systems are moving about in the area. And we see some errors in both temperature and, and precipitation. But even in this case, precipitation can be biased of the order of 
50% actually in these models compared to observations. And if you start looking at extreme conditions, then problems and errors are even larger than that. So this is the current state of these models, that they are describing very many of the features of the climate system, but there are still substantial errors and, and biases in them. A problem here with this model evaluation is actually the observations, since also observations have uncertainties related to them. And uh, this is now two examples of comparison between model output results and two different variables in the Baltic Sea region. In the left diagram, it's both seasonal cycles. We are comparing model output to precipitation. There are two different models and, and three different sets of different observations based on slightly different inf information. And uh, a conclusion from that work was that the observations are really differing quite a lot from each other. The two different observational data sets are differing so much so we can, it's difficult to constrain the model and to say that, wow, well, in this case it's the model that is that, is, uh, that has a problem, but since the, the two different or the three different observational data sets are so different. For other important variables like evaporation to the right, there are virtually no observations at all. And in this case, our model, regional climate model output is compared to other models instead, since we don't have any information. And think about the hydrological cycle and the if you want to make a calculation for the Baltic Sea area and how much water that comes into the system and goes out into, in, the, in, the, in the Danish Straits, it's very, very important to know what is the evaporation from this area, and we don't really know. We have some model assessments of this, and uh, we can always, always calculate the flux, look at the fluxes in the rivers and make backwards calculations, but we do not have direct measurements of this important area. So there are problems also and issues with the observations. Uh, now there are many maps on this one and I don't expect you to look at the details, but the two small maps up to, to the upper, upper left and the, and the one in the upper middle, they are the same ones as you saw a minute ago when we force our regional climate model with observations on the boundaries. The six lower, lowermost panels are instead, uh, in, in those ones, instead we are using data from global climate models on the boundaries. Pictures are quite small, I admit that, but you can really see that the colors are more intense in the lowermost panels, uh, at least by and large in, in general. And that means that the errors and problems are larger if you take data from a global climate model on the boundaries. And there are many red colors in many of these pictures, and that is an indication of uh, that, the, that the climate is too warm, too mild over Europe. And if you start looking at also the lines, they are in saying something about the large-scale pressure patterns. And in these cases, most of these global climate models, they have, have too strong westerlies indicated by these red arrows. There is too much mild and moist air being advected from the Atlantic into to Europe. And this is in the controlled climate. So we, in general, in many of these uh, model integrations of the past climate in the 20th century, models are a bit too mild and a bit too wet. In, in winter time. So now I will turn more into the future. We have now seen that there are some problems with these models. Now we can see what we can say about future conditions. And uh, just first briefly to say something about the emission scenarios or the forcing scenarios. Uh, we are now at a point where we are going from an old generation of emission scenarios to a new, new kind of scenarios called representative concentration pathways. Uh, there are two different approaches in how these scenarios were constructed, and I will not spend too much time on this, but in the old approach, there was a sequential approach starting out from ideas about uh, socioeconomic scenarios, etc., and then radiative forcing was calculated, this was put, uh, the, the uh, concentrations were put into the climate models, and uh, we could make climate project, calculate climate projections which could then be used for impact assessments. This process, is, this process was quite slow and it took long time, many years before the first stage until you can finally get to the impacts and adaptation part of it. So in order to speed up this a little bit when there was a need for new scenarios, more modern ones, one, st 
was determined to start really from the concentrations instead. We started with what kind of scenario do we really want. We want to have some kind of high-end scenarios showing large increases in the forcing and we do have, want to have some scenarios where we have a smaller, smaller increase. So this could then quickly be put into the climate models, but in parallel there was also development of uh, socio-economic scenarios and then these can then be combined into impact, impact studies. So, well, these are at what uh, these new so-called representative concentration pathways look like. To the right, you can see concentrations of carbon dioxide uh, over the 21st century in four of these different scenarios. Uh, they are t called an RCP and then a number, 8.5 for 6.0, 4.5 or 2.6. And these numbers, they say something about the degree of how much you d disturb or perturb the climate system. So the u u this is really a number, a unit, where the unit is watts per square meter. It says something about the imbalance of the, of the radiative forcing of the entire system. And uh, this is maybe not too important with the details, but the important thing is here that you have different degree of them. And corresponding to each of these uh, concentration pathway, there are then emission scenarios to the left. So these are then emissions of carbon dioxide also changing over time. And uh, what we can see here, both in the concentration uh, um, pathways and, and also in the emission of carbon dioxide to the left, we have the green line. And that one is different compared to older scenarios. The old scenarios are the ones uh, in the gray field and the small dotted lines up there. Yeah, hard, hardly readable in the map. But there are a number of these different dotted lines up there saying something about what it did look like in the, in the older scenarios. So what is new here is really that we have these low-end scenarios where uh, the cum cumulative emissions of carbon, uh, carbon is smaller compared to in the older scenarios. Otherwise, the other scenarios, they're quite much spanning the, the range that we have had since before. And this is also then reflected if we look at the climate change uh, impact of these different uh, scenarios. In, these, in, the, in the left panel here, we can see evolution over time in global mean temperature. So these are not, this is now increasing in temperature in degrees on the vertical axis, and then, then we have the time axis down here, starting from the 20th century and then going all the way up to 2300 in the, in the lower panel. And we can really see that the choice, which of these scenarios we follow, there is a tremendous difference in the climate change signal further ahead in time. Not so much in the first decades though. As you can see down here, the scenarios are pretty much showing the same picture in the nearest few decades into the future. But then when we get to the mid of this century and into the future, they start to diverge. And to the right, you can see a comparison between old and new scenarios. So we can see here in that one that the new scenarios to the right are comparing quite well to the one, to the older ones to the left. But we do have also this low end scenario now, this RCP 2.6 as it's called, shows uh, a smaller change compared to the old ones. So I will now start move from this and, and talk about the projections for the Baltic Sea area and we, can, we should look into some results now to see what the models say about the future conditions. So this is again based on global climate models, projected changes in, in a part of the basin. This is again for northern Sweden. We can see changes by the end of this century compared to the 20th century for temperature to the left and for precipitation to the right. So you see for temperature there is a clear warming in all of the different months. You have the black zero line down there and you can see a strong warming in, in all, all seasons and in particularly in winter where temperature are, temperatures are increasing quite a lot. To the right you see precipitation instead and also there we have a lo relatively large increase in, in winter in most of these models while in summer it is more uncertain if we will have an increase or not in the precipitation. Here there are quite many models that are more 
close to the zero lines and some ones are even indicating a decrease in that area. There is a large spread between the different lines here. Different models give a different uh, change. So the, the climate change signal is, is uncertain and we don't really know if any one of these models are more realistic than the other one. So when we are working with these climate change scenarios, we need to uh, look at a large ensemble of different out possible outcomes. And this is, this mo this, um, these figures here, they represent uh, part of what we call the model uncertainty. This is really related to the models, how strong they react on the forcing, on the changes in the uh, carbon dioxide concentrations both on the global scale, but then also in particular here on the, on the regional scale. So we can then do perform downscaling experiments with regional climate models. This has been done here in one large European project called Ensembles, uh, where a number of institutes participated and downscaled a number of different global climate models. And this view graph here shows then simulated changes uh, in temperature for, win uh, for winter, these are the top ones, and for summer, these are the, are the lower ones. And the graphs sh show the smallest simulated increase for each individual point to the left, the median one in the middle, and then the maximum one to the right. So you can see a gradual, some kind of interval here, from going from relatively small changes to the left to large changes to the right. And we don't really know again, if any of these models simulations are more or less realistic than the other ones. So these are some kind of intervals that you can uh, use and think about. But what is very clear here for temperature is that the winter time signal is strong. These are red colors all over the, way, all over the place, where the darkest red is more than six degrees warming. In summer, uh, the, the green starts with a one degree warming, so it's warming virtually everywhere, also in summer in all of these models. Uh, only in parts of northern Germany and, and Poland there are virtually no change in this uh, in, in, in the in the scenario that shows the smallest change out of these 13 integrations so this is now seasonal mean temperature for a three month period we can also look at higher order statistics and look at what, what would happen for instance with extremes and this one here shows example from one climate model where we look at daily temperature statistics from one grid point. This is only one scenario, so it's, it's, but it's just give, to give a flavor of what these results can be used for. This now shows temperature statistics for Stockholm from one model for winter time conditions. And the uppermost, uppermost diagram here shows the statistics in, in the 20th century, in the control period. So you can see there that you have a climate with uh, most of the Many of the days have temperatures relatively close to the zero line here, so we have either melting ice or, or snow, so it's quite close to, this, to zero. Uh, we also have some milder winter days, but then we also have a long tail here to the cold side. So in some of these years, in a third year period, there is really snow cover and we get high pressure conditions and we get really cold weather in the winter. This is the typical climate in Stockholm for winter. And uh, I guess also here in, in Riga, it would look virtually the same. And then we can see what the scenario tells us for the future. Uh, this is now the lowermost graph, and we see a shift to the right of this whole probability distribution. It shifts to the right, indicating warmer conditions. Uh, but there is also diff a change in the shape of this probability distribution. It gets much, much more narrow. So what happens in the future scenario is that the snow cover is really disappearing and you don't have this uh, possibility to really form the very cold air mosses anymore. So the, in this case, the extremes are changing much more compared to the mean changes. And this is something you can see also in summertime conditions quite often, not so much for Northern Europe, but further south in Europe, you see a much stronger increase in the really warm extremes compared to what's happening to the, to the average conditions. So extremes are often changing more than means. The warmer climate has impacts on sea ice. We already heard that before. These are two examples with simulations. Now with 
coupled models where we have not just the atmosphere but also the ocean, Baltic Sea ocean is really included in this model system. So here we can really, that model produces its, its own sea ice cover, which is then more realistic, of course, compared to the global very coarse models as we saw before on the maps. And these are now two examples. The only thing differing here is the forcing data from the global climate model on the, on the, on the lateral boundaries that is far away from the Baltic Sea area. And it shows the seasonal cycle of sea ice in the control climate. This is the blue area. And the, the spread in that area is the interannual variability. Some years we have less ice, and other years we have more ice. And then the future conditions are then the, uh, the pinkish areas. So there is a very strong decrease in the overall extent of the sea ice cover. But you can also see that the ice season is decreasing as well. So instead of starting already in December, it takes, uh, it takes longer time, almost into January, before the sea ice season starts. So there's a shift in, in when is ice is formed, but also when ice disappears in spring. That's also uh, earlier in the warm climate in the future. Apart from changes in temperature and, and sea ice, there are of course also changes in precipitation. Now this is the same concept as before, based on these uh, 13 different regional climate models, showing wintertime conditions on top and summertime conditions uh, in the bottom. Green colors now means increasing precipitation. And uh, um, all of these, most of these models really indicate increasing precipitation in winter. And uh, in summer, it's more uncertain, especially in the southern part of the Baltic Sea area, as you can see down here. There are actually some models indicating that precipitation may increase, while others are showing uh, increases, in, increases in precipitation instead. So we are uncertain even about the sign of change in that area. And then for wind speed, same thing again. I'll just show a few more of these results here now. Uh, here we are much more uncertain. Here you can see that we have green colors increases to the right, both in winter and summer, and we have red colors to the left. So there are models saying decreases and models saying increases. So we don't really know what will happen here. We have different possibilities here. There are some indications, though, in quite many of the models that there, there might be some increases in, in wind speed over, over the Baltic Sea. You can see stronger increases in winter, for instance, over the Baltic Sea, particularly compared to uh, over the neighboring um, land areas. And this is likely re re related to the fact that the sea ice is disappearing, and then you get different altered stability conditions in the atmosphere, and you have a higher possibility for slightly higher wind speeds in the, close to the ground. This is not, not saying that there will be any strong wind storms in those areas, but it says that we will get less calm conditions and instead uh, weak wind conditions. So now this figure here shows again simulated change integrated over the entire Baltic Sea region from some uh, newer scenarios and showing then temperature change versus precipitation change. So you can see there is a very strong relation between increases in, in precipitation and increases in temperature, and both in, in our regional climate model to the left and also in the underlying global climate models. And the different colors here indicate different time periods. So going from green to blue to red is going further into the future, and the climate change signal gets stronger and stronger over time. We do also have two different emission scenarios in this uh, view graph as well. So the, uh, the circles are, are for this high-end scenario, while the uh, stars are for the lower-end scenarios. And there you can see now that if you start to look at the, uh, the first time period, you have both stars and the circles about the same area. So the difference between the emission scenarios is quite small at that time. But when we get to the end of the century, all of these circles with the high-end scenarios, they have been shifted to the right, so they, there's a much stronger uh, signal in the uh, high-end scenario at the end of the century. We can look further into these results. This is now with only one regional climate model, but the differences between the different symbols and numbers here are the different, that we have different global climate models on the boundaries.
And uh, here we can show and, and look at things like changes in precipitation, uh, both in the regional climate model, these are the upper ones, and uh, in, in, the, in the underlying global climate models to the, in the bottom. Uh, so this, there are quite many panels here. I will just briefly tell you what it is, and then I will show a few more of these graphs and point to some of the most important things. Uh, to the left, we see the control period. This is the end of the 20th century. These are, this is something we can compare to observations. How much precipitation is there in, in this case in summer? Uh, the next set of panels here is the climate change signal. And the, in this case, blue colors indicate increasing precipitation and red colors and yellow ones increase, uh, decreases in precipitation. The third one is the spread between the different simulations. And the one to the right says something about how robust this information is. It says how many of these nine different models that indicate an increase in precipitation. And for pre uh, in changes in summertime precipitation, we can see that, first of all, there is a, an increase projected by the models in the Baltic Sea region. And we can see to the right that this is something that virtually all models agree upon. So there are some, some things you can use these relatively large ensembles. This is not true, to, though, for the southernmost parts of the Baltic Sea area down here in in, for instance, in Poland and uh, northern Germany and these areas down here, there is a slight disagreement between the models. So this is seasonal mean summertime precipitation. We can see what, what happens to the extremes instead, this very rainy event that occurs once every 20 years or so, a very strong uh, precipitation event. And so if we have something here we express as the 20-year return value of daily, daily precipitation. So the same thing again, control climate to the left. We have the scenario, the climate change signal, the second one. Uh, and here we see an increase in, in most of the models and, and scenarios. There are blue colors also down in Central Europe in many of these s simulations. And to the right we can see that, again, models are agreeing quite a lot of, on, the, on this. So this is now when we have, uh, when we when we run our regional climate model at a resolution of 50 kilometers, and we know that increasing the resolution even more really improves the capability of, of simulating uh, extreme conditions in, in terms of precipitation. You can, for instance, look at the controlled climate here, comparing the global climate model with the regional climate model. We see larger intensities, which are more realistic. I, I can assure you that compared to what the global climate model says. And if we increase the resolution even further, now here is a slightly smaller ensemble made of only five simulations. Again, on top we have the 50 kilometer runs, but in the lowermost panels we have simulations performed at roughly 12 kilometer simulation uh, resolution over all of Europe. And again, you can look at the intensities to the left, so you can see that the intensity of extreme precipitation really increases when we go to this higher resolution of the models. And this is something that is really being evaluated and an analyzed quite a lot right at this moment. It doesn't, even if we get, we get the magnitude of these events in a better way, it does, but it still doesn't change the overall climate change signal though. But it can nevertheless be important for uh, impact models to have a better idea about the fluxes. So these are some summary in words. I think actually I will skip that since I've shown all of the results already. So I will go through and, uh, and uh, talk a little bit about what all the uncertainties. This will be the last part of the, uh, of the talk. So this is now a view graph showing three different simulations with one global climate model. It's a global mean temperature, so it's nothing to do with the Baltic Sea area directly. Uh, to the, in the right hand side of this, you can see, oh, first of all, we can look at the time scale. We start here at the mid 19th century. This is pre industrial conditions. And we simulate all the way up till 2100. And for the 21st century, we have three different scenarios. So you can, of course, see here that in the, the further we go in, into the future, 
the larger the discrepancy is between the three different scenarios. So the uncertainty related to emission scenario and forcing scenario increases over time into the future. These scenarios are quite similar in the few, first few decades here into the 21st century. But then this biograph also shows that we have three different uh, colors of these lines starting at the left. There is one black, one yellow, and one pink one. And the only thing differing between these three simulations is that the initial conditions in the global climate model in the year 1850 chain is different. And this is related to the fact that we, that we don't really have a clue about what were the initial conditions that we should put into this model system. There are no observations of climate statistics at that time. There are a few surface-based observations of temperature and a few other variables. But we, don't, we need to have information about the whole three-dimensional picture of the climate system, including the deep oceans. And of course, we don't have that information. So the only thing we can do is to take initial conditions from some model simulation of pre-industrial conditions and say that this is 1st of January 1850. And then we can take another 1st of January from this pre-industrial simulation. It may be a long thousand year simulation with no changes in the forcing. And then we can say that this is the 1st of January 1850. And then we do that third time and we get three different realizations of the climate. So you see that the long-term changes and trends, they are very similar here. We, we have imposed some forcing changes over the 20th century greenhouse gases. Well, the, the model will show an increase in temperature, of course. But the changes from one year to another, or from even from one decade to another, is not similar in these simulations. And this is something we call the natural variability. Of the, it reflects the natural variability of the climate system. We do have cold periods, we do have warm periods, and uh, the models are not necessarily in phase with these uh, warm or cold or wet or dry periods for, for that sake. And this is an uncertainty that we have to, have to live with as well. So when we make projections into the future, we don't really know exactly in what phase of this variability we are. So there are then three different types of uncertainties. And this is a view graph showing a little bit how that changes over time into the future. This is now a 100 year time scale here on the, on the lower most axis, starting then from today's conditions. Now we can see that this uh, scenario uncertainty as I described before, this is the vertical axis here says something about the amount, the fraction of uncertainty which comes from different parts here. And uh, we can see easily that the scenario uncertainty increases with time. The further into the future we go, the larger the uncertainty from the scenarios. Uh, we do have then the natural variability. This is the orange line here. And that contribution to the total uncertainty is very large in the beginning when the overall climate change signal is not so big. We don't know if next year will be very cold or very warm. And that uncertainty in the short term perspective is quite, it's quite, it's quite, uh, quite large. These numbers are now for the global mean conditions. And uh, we can look at similar plot but for the region, for a small region, and this is done here. Again, the same one to the left, global mean conditions, but to the right now is for a small area, in this case the British Isles, but it could also be the Baltic Sea area, it's very similar. You can see a few things here, not a few things, that overall the, the lines to the right are a bit higher up, so the uncertainties are higher on the regional scale compared to on the global scale. When we go down to a region, we have a larger larger uncertainty. It's more difficult to say something precise about what will happen here compared to what will happen with the global mean temperature. We can also note that this is especially related to this internal natural variability. The orange line is really way up to, uh, high here in the, in the rightmost panel. So this natural variability is something which is really, really very strong. And I can just shortly illustrate what that comes from in, in the next slide here. Uh, this view graph shows three different climate change uh, simulations from a regional climate model. And I show in the uppermost panels here changes in two meter temperature. This is for a time period that is quite soon in, into the future, 2011 to 2040, compared to a control period in the 20th century. You can see that there are 
quite substantial differences between those three ones. The one in the middle show a very strong increase in temperature over especially Finland and northeastern Europe. The only thing differing between these three is now, again, the initial conditions in the global climate model in 1850. So it's far back in time. But no other differences here. And this comes up, the reason for this is now to be explained by the lowermost panels, which shows differences in the large scale circulation statis statistics of these three different periods, comparing now uh, 2011 time period 2011 to 2040 compared to the controlled climate. And I will not go too much into the de details, but what it's all about here is that in the middle one, where we have this very strong increase in temperature, there is also a very strong tendency for westerly winds, stronger westerly winds compared to the controlled climate. So in that situation, there is much, all of the time, much of uh, mild and moist air being evicted towards um, northeastern Europe. And that leads to a strong climate change signal. In the rightmost panel, this is not the case. There we have a, a, rather a slight tendency for a stronger northerly winds. And in that case, the climate change signal is very, very weak, so at least for uh, Scandinavia and, and the western part of Europe up here. So these differences in, in the large scale pressure patterns uh, is really, really instrumental for uh, the climate change signal in a small area like Northern Europe. So I will finish now by just summarizing a few of what I see identified gaps in the knowledge here when it comes to the scientific parts about the climate models. Um, I've, I've talked about most of them in the talk and uh, I think that the horizontal resolution is one thing, uh, especially in the global climate models, it's still relatively coarse, so we don't really resolve all of the relevant processes. This can partly be uh, helped with the regional climate models, but still we are not uh, taking into account everything we want to include. Most models still have a very, very poor uh, representation of the Baltic Sea. And there are not so ma many model systems, including a coupled model at all, and those that are, they are, have only run a few simulations, and we would really need a much larger effort in this area if we want to say something more specific about the Baltic Sea and conditions in the Baltic Sea. And then I've already mentioned that these climate models, even if they are quite complex, they still compare, uh, perform relatively poor in the, in the Baltic Sea area. I've also indicated that we have a lack of uh, good data, observational data, for evaluating models. For some variables there are no data at all, and for other variables the data are really very different between different data sets. And then if you want to do more impact studies, then I would also say that uh, there is really a lack of more comprehensive Earth system models. If you, for instance, want to look at impacts uh, on the Baltic Sea and in the Baltic Sea and in the ecosystems in the Baltic Sea, you would really need to include also nutrient cycles, etc., in, in, the, in the regional climate model systems to say something about the conditions in the, in the ocean. And finally, if we want to do something about uh, looking at impacts in a, in a more, with a, with a larger scope and also for adaptation studies, I think it's very important that we have uh, large ensembles to work with since there are large uncertainties that we cannot really get rid of. But one thing we can do is that we can illustrate and describe these uncertainties by using large ensembles of model integrations. And by that we can say something more about intervals and ranges compared to uh, showing and illustrating only single scenarios. And with that, I'd like to thank, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks to Eric Hellström for his report. Uh, now we have some time for questions and discussions. And can I ask Andre also in front of auditorium for some questions? So, uh, who will start? Who have some questions? Speakers?
maybe a question to you, Andre. You are working with totally different fields than Eric, and uh, well, very, very applied cities, uh, really actual problems of, of adaptation. And the part of Kelsey of, of Eric is more about uncertainties, how sure in general we can be about the climate change. What's your feeling about climate models and the possibilities to apply them for real adaptation actions? So. Yeah, thank you for that question. I was, uh, after the last presentation, wondering about that myself also. Um, I mean, I think you gave emphasis on the uncertainties, and um, it's probably also good to focus on what we do know and what we can say. So probably that's the first point to make. I think the second point is that it's an increasing realization by many people who are thinking about adaptation that it's not about um, maybe reducing the uncertainties much more in future, but it's rather how to deal with the uncertainties in practice. Um, although I have a question to you, how much you think the uncertainties will be reduced in the next 10 years? Maybe to ask the question to you. But I feel that most people are dealing with that and realize um, we have to deal with the current uncertainties. So that means I think there's an increase in mass realization could think about pathways in the future rather than design one, let's say, adaptation um, uh, option and measure, but uh, design your measure in such a way that they are robust, that they can deal with different um, climate futures, and that they are flexible so that you can change your measure when you have more information. Now, that sounds maybe easy, but in practice, of course, that's really not easy to do at all. So um, I'm afraid there's not a Good answer, but what you're also thinking is that you have to have some experience. Very good question. And uh, in fact, I'm a little bit pessimistic about reducing the uncertainties very much. I think that we might reduce them slightly, but what I think and what I hope is really that where we can get to the climate model is that we can, uh, first of all, that we can. If we improve the models, they can be more useful in terms of the data that comes out of the data in better ways to 
Um, on your last point, I'm not sure if I trust you. I mean, um, I'm aware of the fact that you trust but I'm not sure if I feel that it's very important and important for the street. So, um, I think what we're trying to do is not to draw a picture of what's happening in the world. Now, of course, one solution is not to draw them from the public. So, but we can discuss it, that's fine. Um, I would certainly be in favor of thinking <coughs> with you along on potentially having, let's say, mini IPCC approaches for different regions in Europe. I think that's a good idea. That could be certainly explored. My name is Kristi Nabolin. I'm from University of Latvia, and I have a question for both keynote speakers regarding uh, those losses from uh, climate change, different uh, accidents and, let's call them catastrophes, let's uh, call them so. So uh, what do you think, what would be a smarter investment giving more benefits uh, to improve models and certainty? principle what you said in your slide uh, regarding that we know more about losses because of the wealth and because of uh, how we are acting already now and uh, do we need more knowledge to act uh, more uh, in adaptive way yes thank you <laughs> 
Thanks for both speakers for very nice talks. Uh, I have a question for Andre first. Um, in the beginning, you, you uh, raised up solidarity as, as one of the justifications for a European strategy for climate change adaptation, and I, I did appreciate that thought. Um, you showed a map of Europe indicating different impacts in different areas, and we well know that uh, they, they indeed are different, and also that there are different capacities uh, for adaptation. But then I started to wonder how uh, is that uh, solidarity implemented in adaptation strategy? I can understand that uh, in mitigation actions, what we do in one country help in others as well, if we do it uh, all. But then adaptation per se is, is uh, usually local adaptation. So in your opinion or EEA's opinion, what type of adaptation actions actually do help uh, over the borders and, and uh, what type of actions are really the most solidar? <laughs> yes, and um, I don't have <clears throat> an immediate answer in the sense that we have a view as EA on that. The way I would see it is that um, in the allocation of funds currently being discussed in the uh, EU context, uh, that question will be coming up more and more. And there, I think, there could be ways to, <clears throat> to address the topic of solidarity uh, somehow. For example, you could think of, well, let's say currently the operational programs are being designed for the different uh, future transnational actions. And you could think that where the impacts are highest and where the capacity to adapt is lowest, those are the regions and, and areas and also, let's say, cities where they would have the highest need to get funding. Um, the difficulty, I think, is the process how to get to that analysis and how to get to that allocation of funding. And that, I think, is exactly what currently um, the Commission is doing, but that's very much DG Regio <coughs> in, in um, direct context uh, with the countries to design these operational programs. So, well, one way of looking at it, I think that the operational programs should be highlighting the highest priorities which are needed and um, yeah, they're fed by the information and the needs from, from the countries. I'm not sure if that's fully the answer, but that's what I can say about it. Okay, and now the last question. We will be able to continue our discussions during lunch break, please. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to appreciate uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Klavien that allow me to join in this and participate in this conference. I came from Indonesia. My name is Yudi Widodo from Institute of Legume and Tuber Crops. Uh, I also congratulate to scientists in Baltic region that uh, have a strong effort to combat again climate change. My question uh, especially to Dr. Andre uh, relate to Copenhagen uh, climate uh, adaptation Plans. I think this also as a result of the COP14, because previously uh, COP13 was held in Bali about red reducing emission from deforestation and forest degradation. Uh, that I would like to know, I think this is not only for Europe, but also for uh, global uh, region, uh, including tropical areas. So uh, my question about the implementation of the modeling. So put you and uh, Eric. Uh, how much area can be covered or should be built a meteorological station to collect data? Because for the accurate of your models, 